Welcome to the WAN Show. I don't remember the last time this much stuff happened in the world of tech in the span of a week. And I don't even have my co-host. I have this floating ghost host, uh, my co-ghost. Huh, but that's okay. We're going to get through this, you guys. Man, I don't want the show to be all about outrage. So, um, oh man, I got, uh, RDNA 3 GPUs look great. Oh, and also... Intel On Demand, a.k.a. Hardware as a Service, has apparently been built into next-gen processors. We're going to talk about that and how awful it is very shortly. Also, Middle East divisions of NVIDIA, Zotac, Asus, Gigabyte, and others have apparently been demanding favorable coverage from reviewers, which I think it goes without saying is absolutely unacceptable. Yeah, you took three topics, so now I'm now I'm a little bit thrown off. What I will say is I'm in France. If you can't tell, there's something different, and there's actually some like really cool stuff that I would like to talk about. Oh, Monsieur Lafreniere! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's been a problem. Everyone thinks I can speak it. <laughs> Not a thing. Were you gonna give any topics? No, just the France thing. You took all the topics. There's four topics with the France thing. Well, that's fine. All right, then let's roll that intro. Let's go. It's going to be rough. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going to be easy. <laughs> let's see who sponsored this poop show. Uh, Squarespace. Backblaze and Extra. All right, let's jump right into what even is our headline topic? We kept things kind of vague, allowing us to start with anything we want, I guess. Why don't we jump right into Intel On Demand? Was this the one that you were looking at in the dock going, Oh, really? Are you freaking kidding me? I'm doing my best Luke voice because you're not here to do the Luke voice. Yes, that, this is the one that I had that reaction to. In it, feel, it feels like we are getting the BMW heated seat subscription service. Intel has uh, revealed details. It's uncomfortable. About software-defined silicon, a capability of its next-gen Xeon processors. Intel, I'm going to let you finish, but the other way of phrasing this is it is a, an incapability of next-gen Xeon processors unless you pay. Okay, so the official name is now Intel On Demand, and it will, man, the way, even the way this is worded from Alex Clark, probably copying directly from Intel's own press releases and announcements and whatnot. Okay, so Intel On Demand will allow system administrators allow. to pay extra to enable special purpose accelerators. Let me give you my version of that, okay? Intel On Demand will hold ransom features from system admins unless they pay extra, okay, that much is true, to undisable special purpose accelerators. It's in the freaking hardware. You just unlock it. In the latest SDSI, so this is Software Defined Silicon Patch, it shows that Intel On Demand can do the following. Discover which features are physically present on a particular CPU, offer administrators to activate them, and enable administrators to assess how often they are used. It's currently unclear what exactly will be paywalled, but here are some of the accelerators on Intel's upcoming Sapphire Rapids platform that could potentially be paywalled. Advanced Matrix Extensions, Dynamic Load Balancer, Intel Data Streaming Accelerator, and Intel Quick Assist Technology. Now, this time around, it's limited to the data center, but Intel has actually pulled this kind of bullshit before. In 2010, they tried to do a similar thing where you could unlock hyperthreading and some cache on, was it, was it a Pentium CPU? I can't remember whether it was an i3 or a Pentium branded CPU. It was a Pentium CPU. You would actually, you could buy, you could buy this card. Scratch off gently. Increase the performance of your Gateway SX2841-09E with the processor performance upgrade card. Wow, that's great. I think you mean downgrade out of the box. Um, 
I had no idea this was a thing. That's horrible. There's been a huge breadth of responses, but with some people saying it makes sense and others absolutely hating it. Uh, why don't we let Luke go first? I, I, I feel like you've already had a pretty strong reaction to this. Over. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, there's some things about it that I sort of understand. This enables them to have less total skews. That seems fairly reasonable. There's some, uh, some some notes in here saying like, oh, that means that you might be able to get them for cheaper. I seriously doubt that's going to be a thing. I suspect all of these will just be price increases, uh, a way of inflating the price without actually stating that on the on the on the sticker price on the box. I see a lot of as your note that you just wrote out, I see a lot of benefits here for Intel, like being able to raise the price, but in an indirect way, um, by being able to have less SKUs, by being able to bin things in, in, a, in, a, in a particular manner, all this type of stuff. I by being able to generate ongoing... Way. Ooh, this delay is really bad. Um, maybe by being able to generate ongoing income from a CPU that they used yeah. to just sell once. I mean, that's what investors want to see. They want to see recurring revenue. They do not care how many widgets you can sell in a quarter. They care how many of those widgets you're still collecting money for a year, two years, five years down the road. Over. Yeah, because this right now sounds like you're buying it one time. You're buying a single unlock. But, you know, the ball keeps rolling, right? I, said, I very definitely could see this moving into a subscription service instead. Gross. Gross. And it's particularly um, frustrating for me to see this in the WAN doc this week because just earlier today, I actually finished shooting our full video about the situation where Pantone is holding users' colors hostage for $15 a month. Now, to be clear, this does not appear to be entirely Pantone's fault. Both them and Adobe are staying quite mm, zip-lipped about the whole situation. But what we suspect is going on is that it is a breakdown in negotiations between the two companies that ultimately results in more money for them and a crummier experience, a degraded experience for the user. And I, I don't understand how, how we're allowing this to happen. Like, can you imagine, okay, going into a furniture store and them unilaterally deciding that they don't sell couches anymore? We're not going to sell you a couch, but you could rent one forever for over the lifetime of the product, two times or three times the cost of buying a couch. It's like, okay, cool, but I, I don't want that. I want to buy a couch. Too bad. Yeah, the slow erosion of ownership of anything in our lives is uh, is is not fun. I'm not a fan of it. Um, so here's here's some general reactions. Uh, Cisco, IBM, and many others do this. So Intel's enterprise customers are already used to it. That's I guess a fair enough reaction. Um, you know. It said here, AWS or Azure will just buy what they need and no one will really care. But, I mean, here's a response to that particular take. No, AWS will not simply buy whatever they need. They will actually go build a team to develop their own ARM-based Graviton processors and they will get them fabbed and they will develop software that runs on them in order to say, F*** you, to moves like this. That's what's actually going to happen. In the short term, before companies can execute on a strategy like that, yeah, absolutely. But I see this as a way that Intel is turning the thumbscrews on their, on their customers. And these are customers that have the resources to go somewhere else. This is terrible. Especially these days, especially with AMD killing it. And like you were saying, the opportunity for them to just make their own, I think has like almost never been better. I can't say where I went this week. I also went on a little trip this week. Can't say where, but I will say that, uh, you know, AMD seemed like cool guys uh, with cool products. And that has nothing to do with this conversation that we're having around enterprise CPUs. Uh, but AMD, cool people, cool products, um, you know, like it, like it, you know, red, red products. Um, 
Uh, okay, so here's another take. All right, Intel screwed. They seem to have this belief that no matter what their performance is, they're still the top dog. But in fact, their data center business is spiraling. It's circling the drain. And Intel On Demand just seems to be a way to force their remaining customers to accept another bill to help them prop up that revenue stream so it doesn't look so bad. That one, I wholeheartedly agree with. Uh, finally, the third kind so, of... Go ahead. Oh, geez. <laughs> this, this delay is bad. Uh, so, does it surprise you... I was trying to time it for the ending of your thing. Does it surprise you that this happened under Pat Gelsinger? Well, it didn't. There's no way that this happened under Pat because this is a thing that was obviously set in motion 24 to 48 months ago. I am yeah. frustrated that, um, you know, the, the biggest move he's made that has driven Intel's stock higher is not the huge investments in fab capacity, is not the, uh, the, the refocus on engineering, but rather the layoffs. They laid a bunch of people off and immediately the stock goes up 10%. This is the kind of short-term thinking that absolutely drives me crazy about publicly traded companies and the way the, the the way that Wall Street reacts to the behavior of companies with this with this eye for short term gains and this utter obliviousness to long term strategy. I I, I just I I'm I'm frustrated. Um, I, I I think that for their stock. In the short to medium term, this is probably a really good move, but I would like to think that an engineering-minded person would have the stones to pull the plug on this sooner rather than later and figure out ways to deliver more value to the customer rather than extracting more money from the customer. Yeah, yeah, I do agree. It has been, Pat, by the way, he's been CEO since February 15th of 2021. He's been there for a bit. Probably not long enough to, you know, be there for when this was put in motion, but... Certainly long enough to have stopped it. Yeah. The final take, and I think you already kind of addressed this, is that Intel On Demand will allow for companies that don't require the features to buy CPUs cheaper. And sure, if that actually happens, then fine. But tell me this, riddle me this. Compared to the competition, how much cheaper is a Model 3 that doesn't have the rear heated seats activated? Is it cheaper? Has anyone done the math on this? Because I'm pretty sure the Mach-E is pretty competitive. I mean, it kind of sits between the 3 and the, and the... It's more of a Y competitor. But I think you guys get the point. No, that car is not $300 cheaper. Or even $100 cheaper. You just you're you are paying for it. The hardware is going in. And in theory, yes, they can take that relatively minimal cost, spread it out by like reduce their SKU count. Okay, so that's a clear benefit to a Tesla or an Intel. Reduce their SKU count by just putting it in every time. And then as long as enough people buy it for three hundred dollars, that's so much more than the cost that they can justify putting it into those cars where people don't pay for it at all. But I promise you. I give you my personal Linus Tech Tips guarantee that Tesla is not selling those cars at a loss, Intel is not selling any CPUs at a loss, and you are absolutely paying for anything that they put in it, and if you weren't, they would take it out. So Be I'm true. I'm frustrated. I'm uh I I I yeah, I, I don't know what else to say other than that this isn't even the most frustrating topic this week. Uh, I, oh man, you're gonna have to you guys are gonna have to really forgive me for butchering your names here. Uh, Mustafa and Yasser from YouTube channel Tech Quotes. Um, relatively small channel, but big, okay? So 390,000 subscribers, they're based in the Middle East, have published a video revealing attempts by PC hardware companies to pressure them into altering product coverage. And I would love to say that I'm surprised, but the reality of it is that the PC industry particularly globally, does not operate with the same set of norms that especially we in the Western media might take 
relatively for granted. And I shouldn't even say take for granted. I mean, did you see that uh, that amazing piece that John Oliver did on uh, like sponsored healthcare products in news? Like what was basically keeping news, like small time news media alive in the US is like the, these, the, oh, these like quack, yeah. quack cures and, and products and these, these, these segments that are essentially disguised as news, but actually full on ads. And it was, it was wild to me because for whatever reason, YouTube influencers are apparently more regulated than news media, which, which was mind blowing to me. But anyway, I'll tell you from my experience in the industry, none of what I'm about to tell you actually surprises me that much. I want to make it clear that it doesn't mean that every single person who works for these companies is bad. A lot of what you're going to be observing is a very different cultural understanding of the role of media. And this is something that we have absolutely seen in Western, from Western branches of companies and in Western media. I'd say one of the most notable examples was that situation with Hardware Unboxed, where NVIDIA pulled something very similar, essentially saying, we are going to pull your ability to do launch day reviews if you don't adjust your tone regarding real-time ray tracing. If you don't get a little more positive on this feature, we feel we've worked very hard on. Um, essentially, holding hardware unboxed's ability to bring people news coverage of these cards in a timely manner and affecting their revenue unless they were willing to be more positive. Now, obviously, Hardware Unbox told them to take a long walk off a short pier, and so they should, but it absolutely shows that there's an attitude, particularly, particularly outside of Western circles towards media coverage, that it is essentially marketing that essentially these media companies owe their existence to the hardware manufacturers that they cover and should simply play by the rules or they can destroy them as easily as they created them. So let's talk a little bit about what Mustafa Which will talked about. Call, that will immediately kill any form of objective review and completely ruin the entire reason why literally any of us are here at all. So yeah, like the, it's and, a big problem. And the reason that any of you watch, if all you were watching was an ad and it's not disclosed because it's not sponsored, if all you're watching is whatever the manufacturer wants you to think, well, why don't you just watch their videos? Why don't you just why don't you just have a direct line to their PR department? OK, why don't they just beam their messaging straight into your brain? Right? That's the whole point of independent evaluation is that we can have differences of opinion. Hardware Unboxed is allowed to think, feel, believe that real-time ray tracing is not a huge deal today. They're allowed to think that. And I'm allowed to disagree. I'm allowed to think it's super cool. That's the whole point, right? So let's talk about this. Mustafa showed screenshots of direct messages with Zotac slash NVIDIA reps pressuring him to take down a critical video because bad coverage, and I sh** not, bad coverage will lead to company layoffs. Well, who, who had the bad coverage of Twitter this week is what I want to know. Sorry, sorry, too soon. Um, then... <laughs> Meanwhile, Asus was upset because TechQuotes' video about a motherboard launched a few hours after the 3 p.m. embargo and after a different video about a gigabyte motherboard. Now, this is something we've definitely seen before. Companies believing that when they provide a review sample, you are somehow obligated to hit an embargo time and date. Let me inform you, in case it was not abundantly clear before, your embargo is your embargo. It is a time before which we agree to not publish the information. 
We are not under any obligation, no matter what motherboard or graphics card or monitor you've sent, we are not under any obligation to actually publish at that time. And if we feel there's a better time for our channel or for our staff to complete the work or for our audience to, uh, to see it, maybe there was something we feel was more important for them to see first, then that is absolutely a decision that we will make at our sole discretion and you will deal with it. If you are upset, we can send you back the product if we, you know, ultimately decided not to cover it or whatever else, but we don't work for you. <laughs> I'm not I'm not an Asus employee, not an Nvidia employee. You're not my boss. The deal is if the product is cool, we'll cover it. And if it's really cool, we're going to cover it super positively, and that's going to be great for your sales. And the risk you take is that if we don't like it and we don't cover it positively, either through not reviewing it at all or negatively covering it, you take that criticism, you improve it, next time you bring us something better, and we love it, and you sell a bunch of them. That's the deal. That's how it works. And if we don't maintain our independence then nobody will believe us anyway. And you're going to have no media and you're not going to get that positivity when you release something great. Like, that's the thing. They love, I mean, we especially saw this with the hardware unbox thing. NVIDIA literally still had quotes on their website from Hardware Unboxed, yeah. helping them boost the messaging for good products. But then they're not willing to take the other side of that coin. And it's the same thing with these guys here. Gigabyte, meanwhile, asked, <laughs> this is great, asked them to remove the name of a competing motherboard from a motherboard review. How are you supposed to review a product without mentioning a competing product? And that's, that's something that you expect from an advertisement or potentially a like heavily sponsored video where there would be disclosures about the fact that this is a sponsored video. Of so course. the audience should expect these types of things. Of course. Not a review. No, Never these, these were not sponsored videos. That needs to be clear because there's a lot of sponsored content out there. We do sponsored content. And in a sponsored video, you have to understand, I'm never going to lie to you, okay? I'm never going to tell you guys something that I don't believe. If I say it looks cool, if it's in a sponsored video, that means I think it looks cool. However, every sponsored video does go under the microscope from the brand. And every brand has their own policies, Okay, so some brands, oh man, I've got a great story for you guys, actually. Um, was it a sponsor? I think it was a sponsor video, actually. Okay, this is a really good story. Um, <laughs> I won't say who it was, but some brands can be uh, very liberal, okay? Uh, like Intel Extreme Tech Upgrade, for example. As long as we had like some Intel, some tie into Intel Tech, they were chill. They just wanted to be the, the, the presenting sponsor of Intel Extreme Tech Upgrade. And that's part of what made that content so great. But we've run into just utterly ridiculous situations with brands, okay? Um, I'm not going to name a specific name, but I will say that this particular brand is what's known as a chai bowl, I believe is the pronunciation. Um, essentially a gigantic, uh, a gigantic organization in South Korea, okay? This particular brand makes TVs, okay? Uh, so that narrows it down a fair bit, but I'm not gonna say which one. But we did a sponsored video for this particular brand at some point, and they literally, okay, I sh** you not, they literally were upset about the color of some lights in our background because they felt that those that color of light might elicit um, associations with the other one of these brands. And we were like, okay, A, that color looks nothing like them. Okay, so we're not even talking mentioning that brand, okay? This is how, this is the kind of petty stuff I'm talking about. Uh, we, we don't even name them. We literally just have a color of light in the background in the, of the video. Like, are, are you, are you even for real right now? I never heard about this. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I actually hadn't heard about it either until I went on a trip recently with Colton. He was telling me about this. Like, what? 
This is why I'm so glad that I have a business team that acts as like, uh, yeah. you know, that, you know, the meme with the like sleeping at night. And then there's like the soldier absorbing all the knives. Like that is what our business team does for me, because that is the right. kind of thing that when we are trying to get a video over the finish line, okay, we're trying to get it out to the people, uh, to, to enjoy, we hope. And, and, and that is a conversation I'm having. I literally like get a splitting headache. Like it's not an expression that level of stupidity actually makes my brain hurt. I can't, I just can't. And so they, they act as my, as my shield so I can sleep peacefully at night, not having to freaking worry about some stupid, stupid color of light in the video. Color in the video. <laughs> Unreal. All right. So oh, I am man. apparently specifically mentioned uh, at nine minutes and one second. I wouldn't have known the timestamp, but okay. As an example of a large YouTuber who can choose to not commit to publishing a video right when the NDA lifts, um, quote, can the largest corporation on the face of the earth argue with him about it? Definitely not. But I would like to point out to Mustafa and Yasser that that is actually not the case. NVIDIA has um, not basically... Okay, I shouldn't say not spoken with me, um, but NVIDIA has not said more than one word more than they absolutely have to me have to to me since the hardware unboxed debacle it is very clear that i am in their bad books and um we absolutely can butt heads with brands large and small um recently we had that uh, i'd say that's not parallel so i'm not going to talk about that but what I will say is that it is true that we will probably still get seeded with review samples. So even right in the aftermath of that, we did still get review samples, even if it was extremely coldly. My understanding is that LTT Labs actually has a bit of a better working relationship with NVIDIA. But again, this is... Um, this is still more evidence, as if I needed any more, that the, the, the cold treatment was absolutely personal and uh, not anything to do with the content. Um, so, yes, people do argue with me, and we do sometimes get, um, you know, I guess, yelled at. But I guess, I guess you're right. There was a situation, uh, AMD launched, I believe it was a, I believe it was a GPU uh, that we just didn't publish we didn't publish at embargo um i think we ended up like it not being a review it was basically just us talking about how this is ridiculous and then nvidia had a i think a titan card that they just like dropped like they just launched didn't communicate anything about and we basically said yeah we're just never going to review this then forget it uh we're not gonna we're not gonna like play this stupid game where you guys just go boom there's a gpu go and then it's everyone competing to see who can pull the biggest all-nighter in order to get coverage of this up. Like, that's that's ridiculous. It's unprofessional and it's disrespectful. So we basically just said, no, we're not going to do it. Um, Mustafa claims that Gigabyte and or NVIDIA were upset about a video on the 2060 Super that he did in collaboration with them. They asked him to take down the video and modify it. After he didn't, he claims NVIDIA shut him out during any new launch. Uh, the complaints that Mustafa received were, and this is mind-blowing, AMD was mentioned, a favorable Call of Duty benchmark graph came after other graphs, and an Amazon link was in the video description, which all three of which are totally common practice in a review. At the end of 20... Well, the one thing, the yeah. one thing that I'm not 100% certain about here and maybe it is a review, but it says uh, a video that he did in collaboration with them. Um, Does collaboration count as just a review sample or like was there something more? Hmm. You know what? Not 100% sure. The way it's worded sure. in our doc, it sounds like it might have been like a, a some type of thing that's beyond a review. And well, at that point, like, I don't know. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to provide any additional light on that. Hopefully, uh, someone who knows more about the situation can pipe in in the comments on the VOD or something like that. 
Uh, but sure, yeah. at the end of 2019, NVIDIA apparently asked Mustafa to make a marketing video with a script pre-written by them and label it as a review. Mustafa claims that if he didn't go along Ugh. with NVIDIA's requests, he would get blacklisted and that the same mail he received was forwarded to all content creators out there. AMD apparently completely refuses to send them anything, so they have to buy stuff. I mean, that's fair enough. You don't have to engage with every single media outlet in the world. Where things go yeah. wrong is when you try to coerce the ones that you are engaged with or even are not engaged with. Try to try to manipulate the rules of engagement so that you can ensure that all media who cover you are favorable. Apple's at least smart about it. Their rules are all unwritten. So they will just cut you off if you step out of line and they will only invite people who have a long perfect history of covering Apple the way that Apple likes to be covered. Um, so, I mean, at least you have to give them credit for being better at being insidious bastards, I guess. Um, One issue, too, is like, yes, they don't, they don't have to engage with every reviewer. Um, I mean, we, we didn't send the screwdriver to every single person that has ever shown a tool on camera on YouTube. Um, but it is a little brutal when you are trying to do this as your mainline thing, like th this isn't a small creator, it's 390,000 subscribers, right? Yep. Not being able to get these things early is going to be a performance nerf for his ability to grow his channel. Absolutely. Uh, so by, by doing stuff like this, by pulling these things from these creators, you are directly attacking their livelihoods. And directly attacking the ability of your customers in these regions to get information about your products which is pretty yeah. stupid. Um, yeah. The last thing is Mustafa says that they tried to make a 4090 review using an ROG Strix gaming GPU, but the card wasn't posting on all platforms. He had to experiment for 12 days to come up with a solution, and after he finally got it working, Asus had him send the card back without finishing the review. Sometimes that is how things work, especially with bigger items. I mean, we have to send things back all the time. Um, but it's frustrating that he wasn't able to finish the review. Like, if the issue was with the card, I'm sure Asus could like make another 4090 if they need one for something rather than take this one back. However, sometimes there is a limited number of review samples in the budget and the card has to go to the next reviewer. We've, we've seen that many times as well. So our discussion question here is, why does this keep happening? Is the only way for these companies to be kept honest by large YouTubers calling them out? And... What if Tech Quotes, sorry, that's the name of their channel. What if Tech Quotes hadn't had the stones to speak up publicly? I wouldn't have even known. Like, that's the thing is, you know, I've been told before, like, hey, Linus, you have this perception of how great this company is to work with, but it's it's only you, dude. Uh, maybe they're just like afraid to tick you off because you're going to go on WAN show and do a 20 minute tirade on how awful they are and how stupid they are, which is a very real possibility. You'd be pretty uh, effective sometimes. But like if they hadn't if they hadn't been willing to speak up, how are we gonna know about it? What's the solution, yeah. Luke? Yeah, no, true. I uh, I don't think there is one. Um I think we have to keep doing what we do, which is rage loudly every single time it happens. Uh, because hopefully that will reduce the amount of times that it can happen. But we're we're in a situation where you have these absolutely gigantic, uh, untouchable companies that can just beat around these relatively small creators. Um, and and I'm not trying to bash on anyone by saying relatively small, um, but those are the easiest targets for them to go after. Those yeah. are the easiest people for them to try to control because any impact on those people's livelihoods is going to be a, 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 a more brutal hit, basically. They have a higher chance of being able to control these people. And it's really good when people like tech quotes don't, don't take that. Yeah, um, don't back they, down. They don't take it on the chin. They, they fight back. They reach out. It's, it's, it's good. It's scary. Um, and I, I definitely applaud the bravery and hopefully we can help by broadcasting it here. But man, you know yeah, what is, know. you know, what's kind of a, a maybe dumb concept that I had for the lab was like a, um, like if there's niches that we don't cover, maybe having like, uh, like, I don't know, I don't know how we would make this work. 
but maybe there's like uh, like a special line of merch or something like that that you know some of the proceeds go to this like slush fund that's like uh, a way for the community to nominate uh, like certain reviewers for certain categories, maybe especially ones we don't really cover, uh, where we can essentially sponsor like small reviewers who are doing really exceptional work or, or something like that. Like, I, I, I don't know. I how do you, people. yeah. How do you, how do you take the, the distribution of review hardware out of the hands of the most conflicted entity in the entire transaction? Well, that, that's where you always have the problem, though, is the embargo, right? Because yeah. like, uh, YouTube viewers will get mad about things like clickbait titles and thumbnails, but they work. And they're, because they work, it's extremely important for people to do at least a certain amount of it. You can debate where that line is, but you're going to have to do some amount of it. You have to make your, your video very enticing to click on. Another really important thing on YouTube when it comes to uh, embargoed hardware is releasing your video on time. If you're late, you're going to get way less views. So to a certain degree, unless we find some way to start handing out embargoed hardware to reviewers, which is like not going to happen, um, there's, there's a limit on how much we can help in that way. Because just being able to buy things while very noble, it's not actually enough if you want your YouTube channel to be able to perform better, you know? Got it. Tech Quotes is apparently in the chat over on YouTube. Um, Hello. YouTube chat is really not the best way to... Really difficult to use. <laughs> uh, yeah, to, to talk to you. Um, <laughs> but hey, thank you so much for tuning in. And to speak to you directly now then, thank you so much for talking about this because this behavior will never go away as long as they get away with it. Uh, there is a hashtag. So hashtag respect underscore ME underscore PC underscore community. If you want to put some pressure on these hardware manufacturers, that is absolutely the hashtag to use. But I guess that's going to depend on uh, how... Uh, <laughs> how much you're going to be using Twitter over the next little bit. That transition is amazing. <laughs> The first week of Elon Musk's ownership of Twitter has been, no matter who you are, no matter what side you're on of whatever conflict you feel like you're engaged in, it's been a ride. <laughs> on Tuesday, uh, Elon tweeted that uh, Twitter Blue is going to cost $8 a month. This was after debating with Stephen King, of all people, the cost. Um for users who pay the fee, you will get a blue check mark. Priority in replies, mentions, and search. Uh, this one is a pretty deep conversation, but we'll get to that. Whether uh, whether a public square free speech platform should prioritize um, users who can afford to pay. That seems like exactly the kind of concept a billionaire would come up with. Um, yeah. You'll get the ability to post long video and audio and half as many ads. I love that you... Don't even get the it's ads not, removed. It's not zero. That was honestly the thing that I reacted to the most when I saw it. It's like, really? I still get ads? <laughs> Come on. It's not even cheap. It's $8. That's a lot. Yeah, oh which is hilarious. Uh, there's I can't believe they didn't go with the relatively industry standard five. Like, like for so many different things on the internet, you want a subscription for it, it's five bucks, five bucks, five bucks, all over the place. And they're like, no, eight. Eight. And they give you less. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it was it was it was Elon's uh, excellent negotiation skills. He said twenty. Stephen King said too much, and Elon's like, "How about eight? It's like, eight. Okay, uh, sure. Now this this raises some serious questions. Okay, so starting with the blue check mark. Um, well, what are we going to do about public figures who were, as far as I can tell, the reason for verification in the first place to avoid impersonation? Uh, Twitter will apparently give them a secondary tag under their name, like state official. Now, this is really funny because by doing this, Twitter actually negates or like eliminates the prestige of the blue check mark in the first place. Now everyone's going to want a secondary tag because here's the thing, guys. Okay. You don't want some crap, stupid, like little icon that anyone can buy for $8. 
if you are if you are if you want to be like if you want to you know throw your your gonads around you want to be someone who can get special treatment without paying for it right you want the exclusivity so nobody's going to want the 8 dollar check mark anymore everyone's going to want a secondary tag now obviously except they will except they will because of that one that you pointed out priority and replies mentions and search that's actually huge <laughs> i think that brands will pay for it i think that it is extremely unlikely that regular users will pay for that i strongly disagree do you i strongly disagree i think up and coming creators are going to be all over that okay well i guess we're gonna have a look i mean up and coming creators spend a lot more than eight dollars a month on equipment for twitch streaming for example and that's yeah. basically breaking it breaking out in twitch streaming is basically the odds are like winning the lottery so Clearly, people are are willing to to spend money in order to try to make it on social media. Uh, one funny result. See, yeah, go ahead. You see, um, oh man, I just went totally off the rail. Oh, you see articles all the time about how so many kids in North America stuff want to become YouTubers and yep. and TikTokers and whatnot when they get older. It, it, I think it's going to become one of those things where like, you know, everyone who starts a business, oh, they, they want to go get business cards, even if they don't need them. They want to go get pens with their new company name on it, even For if sure. they don't need them. They want to do all those little things they feel like is the right thing that they're supposed to do. Yep. And I think he's trying to make the check mark become one of those things. You want to you want to be a known person on the Internet, you need a check mark or else you're not going to be known because you're not going to be prioritized in search. So no one's going to be able to find you. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I don't know. I guess I'm going to be a great test case for this because I'm not buying one. So yeah, me either. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how this goes. Um, notably, I am not verified already, so there's no blue check mark to take from me. I will say, though, that the LTT official handle will probably pay for Twitter blue. We might already pay yep. for Twitter blue on that handle. So uh, I, I'll leave that up to the social team. But that's that's a corporate expense. I'm not pers I'm not personally paying what. A hundred dollars a year? Are you are you high again? Like I just I can't. I can't, man. Um, yeah, let me do. I'll do a poll. What, what flow plane people are going to do? Meanwhile, to demonstrate the issues with paywalling verification rather than verifying based on an actual need, like as a public service for the community on the platform. Um, many, many Twitter users, both with and without check marks, have been impersonating Elon Musk. And the only funnier thing than that is how quickly they've been getting banned. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. Gosh, I wish I'd left someone on staff to make sure this is me. <laughs> 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 oh, no. All right. So that was Tuesday. On, <laughs> on Wednesday... Reports came out that Twitter might allow users to post video and put them behind a paywall. Only tweets anyone? Essentially, Twitter's becoming even more porn than it already was. This might actually be the smartest move of all. Like, but there are there there is a flip side. Dang it, Luke, which one was the which one was the platform that was like basically all porn? And then they banned porn and then it was dead when like Yahoo bought Tumblr. it. Tumblr. Tumblr was the one. Tumblr. Um, so it's pretty clear that porn can be an enormous part of what keeps uh, a community like a, a social media platform uh, alive and, and vibrant. The problem with porn is that currently a big part of Twitter's business model is advertising. And advertisers, a lot of them, are super not down with porn and the kinds that are are not the kinds that you want to be scrolling past when you're sitting on the bus so i guess we'll see how that goes then on that being said there is a lot of it already on twitter oh yeah oh for sure man i clicked on a i clicked on a uh, like a trending topic that was like dismay or something like that, or disappointment, or something. It was some totally unrelated word. And one of the first pictures I saw was not quite full nude pornographic, but boy, was it close. And I'm like, I'm at work. Thankfully, I have like a private office, but that's not the kind of thing that I expect to see when I'm just idly browsing an app. Like, my kids are not allowed Twitter. 
No way. Twitter is dangerous to scroll through. It, it, like it, uh, the amount of times that someone that I follow because like I, I like know this person and I think they're cool. And then it, it's they have like the 1 a.m. probably didn't mean to click on it tweets that end up showing up in mine because it's like horny on main you know like this i'm like i don't want to i don't want to know that you like that i just <laughs> yeah this doesn't enhance my relationship with you in any way <laughs> not not trying to kink shame or anything it's just not necessary yeah, that, that's fine i just i just don't i don't need it in my twitter feed that's all that's all i'm saying i don't know uh. if this is actually true can you guys can you guys does anyone actually know if this happened uh, there's someone said that an outgoing Twitter employee suspended Elon Musk's account on the way out. I find that kind of hard to believe because that could be, that could result in some kind of, of action. And we know that Twitter basically logged, locked everyone out, then announced that there were going to be mass layoffs, then did it and then let everyone who was being kept. Yeah. Apparently, uh, apparently it was fake. Yeah. That, that makes sense. I find that Conrad says it's true. Snopes debunked it though. All right, sounds like there's uh sounds like this is very much a developing conspiracy theory. All right. Then Thursday, Musk directed Twitter's teams to find over 1 billion dollars in infrastructure savings. That evening, a memo was sent internally confirming that Twitter would be laying off 50% of the staff. So, you're going to do this big project and you're going to have half as many people to do it. Let's go! Um, employees took to Slack to bid their farewells, and this morning, employees were notified about their job status, uh, either by email to their official Twitter email, or by email to their personal email. And that should give you some idea which email the uh, message came to, whether you were still going to be working at Twitter or whether you were not anymore. The departments affected appear to include product trust and safety, policy, communications, tweet curation, ethical AI, data science, research, machine learning, social good, accessibility, and even certain core engineering teams. In an FAQ, impacted employees were told if they sign a release all claims document, they'll get one month of base pay severance. But then Elon just tweeted that everyone was offered three months of severance. Uh, also, there's a class action that's going on already that tw former Twitter employees are signing on to uh, because terminating in the state of California with less than 60 days of notice is actually not allowed. So it's going to be Elon versus California round 65. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, something that I think is pretty interesting is that I sent Linus some stuff on this earlier in the week, but it wasn't just Twitter that has had like massive recent layoffs and there's been lots of other ones, but I think on one day, like four or five different companies laid off between 10 and 20% of their staff. And then Twitter also laid off 50% of their staff. The amount of skilled experienced developers that are flooding the market with, with job applications is going to be a very interesting thing to witness, yeah. but also something that I think is going to be kind of interesting is the impact on service companies. Something that has become a massive business is becoming a, a, a service company that can provide a slightly better experience that can save almost any amount of time for developers. Uh, hmm. There's tons of different things out there. And when uh, you know uh, many tens of thousands of them are fired <laughs> in the span of a few months, uh, I wonder what's happening to those companies. And I wonder if a lot of those companies are going to have to fire people. And this whole thing is just going to turn into a cyclical nightmare. Um, because, yeah, a lot of subscriptions are getting canceled, I'm pretty sure, right now. Well, here's the thing, right? Like, the, the recession has been looming for some time. Um, some domino has to be the first to fall. And tech... I mean, the tech sector has been taking an absolute pummeling for the entire year. Um, I personally am not as affected by it. I don't like I don't have investments in any tech stocks other than framework, right? So, okay, and that's uh, that's not even a publicly traded company. So I have no idea what that investment is actually worth day to day. You can't yeah. you can't like 
open up your phone and be nauseated by watching your, you know, entire net worth drop by 4% one day. You know, like it just doesn't really work like that. Speaking of which, I mean, NVIDIA is having a good day today. So is Coinbase of all people. Um, Snap is down again, but you know, that's nothing new. Uh, <laughs> I, I do. That's how that works. I, I do. Tr I do track it just to kind of you know have some idea what's going on. But it's interesting. I'm not affected by it. Um, but I will be more broadly. I mean, how many of those? How many of you guys watching? Uh, okay, a bunch of you are going to lie, but I'm sure there are people watching right now that are only watching the Wan Show because they're not busy at work at Twitter. Like, <laughs> it's. I'm serious. It's. It's a huge part. <laughs> Like it's it's always hilarious to me when I walk into like a software company and try to go anywhere, right? Like if I walk into a Google office, you know, never mind like the YouTube staff that are actually, you know, supposed to be escorting right. me and stuff, but just just like random people will pop out of cubicles and be like, I know that voice. <laughs> like it's it's a it's a huge part of our audience. So the the impact on on our business could be enormous, right? So it'll and and as soon as it impacts us, well, all of a sudden, you know, you can see how this belt tightening, right? It just rolls down the hill, rolls down the hill until all of a sudden everyone has tight belts. Maybe they could get a new one, LTTstore.com. I'm actually wearing a prototype LTT belt. I mean, it's just it's just a belt, but like an interesting bit too is like it's quality. Traditionally, quality. if a, if a, if a absolute massive ton of skilled developers rolled into the job market all at the same time, it wouldn't even matter because there's companies that are trying to hire basically as aggressively as possible at all points of time. So all these people just get scooped up right away. But a lot of corporations right now, if they're not doing layoffs, they're, they're very likely freezing uh, incoming employees. So they're not hiring. And there's so, new graduates. So the graduates don't stop coming. Yep. We saw this in the pharmacy, uh, local in the BC pharmacy market shortly after Yvonne graduated. She went straight out of school into a management position for Costco. And like two years later, like two classes after her, basically people were like shipping out to tiny towns of a couple thousand residents in order to find any kind of possible work. Like it happens overnight because there's this there's this push and pull effect, right? So you pump out more graduates, and then demand is uh, is is met, and then you know wages are suppressed, and then people don't really go into these programs, and then you run out of new graduates, and it's like oh no, now there's some people retiring, and then all of a sudden uh, wages go up, and people enroll, and they over enroll, and then you know it's like it's this it's a cyclical thing, right? And so it looks like we're heading into a pretty pretty rough cycle. Pretty rough cycle. Including for Twitter, because that poll might as well be completed at this point, and 4% of people said that they were going to get Twitter blue. Oof. That's, Which is uh, honestly slightly higher than I expected. That's 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 a yikes. That's a yikes right there. Still, if 4% of the users on Twitter bought Twitter blue, I mean, that would be a revenue source. We just have to hope that it'll outweigh the um, advertisers that they might tick off with their only tweets um, paid paid video posts. Well, didn't he say something? I don't know if it's in the doc, but I think he said something about uh, a pretty massive amount of advertisers literally already leaving the platform. Yeah. Like, I think Twitter's revenue has seen a noticeable decrease already by like a double digit percentage. Cool. Um, I mean, yeah, with how... One of the things advertisers like left wing, right wing, you know, um, tech or farming equipment, whatever, right? Okay, a thing that advertisers like is that the platforms and publications that they work with have consistency and stability. And right now, no matter what my leanings were, religious, political, or, you know, whatever else, right? Like pick a hot button topic and, and let's say, you know, that one side or the other. What I would not like is the amount of upheaval that I've seen on the platform in just the short week that Elon's been in charge. And this is not one of our discussion questions, but this is something that I want to pivot to, is how terrifying is it? I actually didn't realize until the whole 
you know, meta investment fiasco, just Zuckerberg wanting to spend like tens of billions of dollars a year on the metaverse, even though his investors hate it. I didn't actually realize until I was digging into some articles about that, that he owns 55% of the voting shares of Facebook. I didn't realize he was the sole monarch of Facebook. I, I thought, yeah, public company, he's probably sold off a significant amount of it, and, and he has, but the voting shares are still held majority by Mark Zuckerberg. So think about this for a minute. Between Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk, basically the entire text-based social media, social media, mainstream platform. social media ecosystem is completely controlled by two billionaires. I mean, if you include TV and radio, doesn't it just make it three billionaires? Um, well, no, because you've got uh, Murdoch and you've no, got... Murdoch yeah, whatever. Bezos owns the Washington Post. Um, like, no matter which, oh. si no matter which side you're on, right? That's bad. That's terrible. It's unacceptable. We're in trouble. For real. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah Bloomberg is another one people mentioned. Also, I, I found the exact quote. He said, uh, Twitter has had a massive drop in revenue due to activist groups pressuring advertisers. Massive drop in revenue. Sounds a little spooky, considering it's only been one week. Yeah, that's uh, that's that explains why he's trying to get apparently this Twitter blue thing with the with the verified users rolled out by like Monday. That's going to be pretty tough, given that you're not even able to get access to your office with your badge. I think until Monday. So, um, good luck with that. <laughs> oh man, oh man, things are things are interesting. More fun news. RDNA3? Uh, no, we should do sponsor spots. The show is brought to you today right, by right. Squarespace. If you're building your brand online in 2022, you should absolutely not rely on a social media platform. You should have your own website because you never know when that social media platform is going to completely go and take a left turn. And if you needed to, oh yeah, okay. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to help you expand your brand online. You can make a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything and everything from products to content. We love Squarespace. We use it here at LMG. I actually found out just two days ago that we pay for one of our Squarespace sites. I assumed they were comped because Squarespace spends so much money advertising with us, but no, we actually pay for ltxexpo.com. I just didn't know. Uh, it's custom templates make it easy to stand out and you can maximize your visibility thanks to their suite of integrated SEO features. Their analytics insights help you optimize for performance to see what's going well and what needs a little work. And there's I mean, do I need to give you more reasons to start today? Just go to squarespace.com forward slash when to get 10% off your first purchase. That's right. We like it so much. We actually use it and pay for it. Oh, speaking of things we like, Backblaze. Starting at just $7 a month, Backblaze offers an affordable and easy to use cloud backup solution. They make... They make backups simple by allowing you to backup almost anything from your Mac or PC and access it anywhere in the world via their web and mobile apps. Backblaze even lets you restore your data by mail. A hard drive will be shipped right to your door, and once you're done copying it wherever you want to copy it, you can return the hard drive within 30 days for a full refund. And if you're worried about accidentally deleting files, you can increase your retention history to one year for an extra two bucks a month. With over 55 billion files restored and two exabytes of data under their management, Backblaze has got you covered. So don't be that person who forgets to back up their important files. Sign up and get a free, oh, get a 15-day free trial with no credit card required at backblaze.com slash WAN. Finally, the show is brought to you by Extra. Extra is a US debit card that builds your credit. It connects to your bank account, then it spots you for your purchases and pays themselves back the next business day. This will not make a ton of sense to our viewers in Europe or realistically outside the US and Canada probably, but this can be very useful. Just 
okay, bear with me here. Extra will total up all the purchases you've made with the card each month and submit it to the big credit bureaus like Equifax and Experian. This is a great way to build credit as it turns your transactions with the card into a series of credit-worthy payments. There are no hidden fees, no interest, or fear of your data being sold, and Extra's credit building plan costs $149 for the entire year, and you can earn up to 1% back in redeemable reward points for only $50 more. Um, I started building my credit at 16 years old through paying off my own small transactions with a low limit credit card. And it's actually basically what extra does is exactly what I did. So the day I turned 16, I had my parents co-sign for me. And again, this is going to be something that our viewers from outside North America might not really understand, but credit over here matters a lot. And maintaining a good credit rating is like critical for certain things that you might need to do. Um, so what I did was I got just a $500 credit limit card because I didn't know if I was going to be able to trust myself to be responsible with a credit card. And that was less money than I had to completely pay off if I did, you know, go completely off the rails and my parents co-signed it for me. Thank you very much to my parents who were able to help me with that. And what I would do is I would, I would buy things with it. I would keep my receipts. I would go home because I didn't have a smartphone because they didn't exist yet. I would go home and I would immediately pay it off. So I would spend, immediately pay off, spend, immediately pay off. I actually had friends that told me I was crazy because like, oh, you should just wait the 30 days because there's no interest for 30 days. And I was like, no, because this is the way that I can help manage my spending in a way that I will never end up paying any credit card interest. And that actually worked really well until Linus Media Group uh, when we had people other than me and Yvonne managing our credit card payments. So now I have actually paid credit card interest for the first time in my life, but I, I didn't for like my first 10 plus years of having a credit card. So the extra debit card is issued by Evolve Bank and Trust, member of FDIC, and you guys can learn more at the link in the video description. It's extra.app slash wanshow. All right. What do you want to jump into now, Luke? What do you want to jump into now? <laughs> Is there any good news? I think RDNA 3. Yeah, we could talk about RDNA 3. RDNA 3 is good news, right? I think so. You sure you don't want to talk about the worst active noise cancellation on AirPods that people thought they might be imagining but actually turned out to be true? Apple downgraded the AirPods. Uh, sure. Yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah, do we have in here why? Yeah, the patent troll stuff? Yeah. We got that in here? We got that in yeah, here. Okay. Yeah. So this first broke when yeah, users... Yeah, this is honestly really sad. Yeah. Users felt like, hey, what's going on here? Apple released the AirPods Pro 2s, and they're like, blah, 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 blah. they're up to two times the ANC. But I could have sworn my AirPods Pro 1s had better ANC, like, like a few months ago. So it turns out that that actually happened. Apple did downgrade the active noise cancellation in some of their products. Uh, ratings.com, R-T-I-N-G-S, that's how they spell it apparently, .com recently confirmed that active noise cancellation has gotten worse on the AirPods Max following firmware update 4071. I should be happy Apple has no way to update firmware other than connecting to an iPhone because my AirPods Pros still work great. Um, so firmware <laughs> update 4E71 back in May. Many people assumed this was a case of forced obsolescence, making the product worse to boost sales of its successor. Reddit user Facing Condor has laid out well-cited research indicating, though, that Apple may instead be quietly replacing the ANC tech in their products to protect themselves in an ongoing lawsuit against a patent troll company, Jawbone Innovations, who acquired what was left of defunct Bluetooth headset maker Jawbone back in 2017. I remember Jawbone. Oh, huh, what a thing. Jawbone Innovations sued Apple in September 2021 for infringement of eight noise cancellation patents, and the next month, Apple released a firmware update for the AirPods Pro 1 that reduced its ANC effectiveness. There's some debate about when the ANC effectiveness was actually reduced. It may have been earlier, but this would still make sense given that the patent troll was probably trying to renegotiate before, or was trying to negotiate before suing. A year later, AirPods Pro 2s were released with up to two times ANC improvements. It seems likely we'll see something similar happen with AirPods Max. Uh, facing Condor claims that making product changes may reduce Apple's chances of facing a ban on imports or sales during the trial. Discussion question. Things aren't always as they seem. Should we apologize to Apple for all the times we've assumed things about them? 
No. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, some, sometimes... I think we should just do this type of reporting as well. We, sh we should point out when there was some cloak and dagger stuff going on in the background. For sure. Um, and we should... I, I, I think it's good that Apple has been working to try to make improvements despite the patent trolling going on. And I think we should give them that pat on the back. But no, I, I don't think you should apologize for what we've said in the past because we there's no way for us to know that this is what's happening and we still need to do uh, as reviewers we still need to look critically at companies so it is what it is uh by the way luke uh do you want to talk a little bit about what you're doing over there uh float plane chat is trying yes. to find you right now by the way oh i don't think that's gonna work i don't think i'm in a very descript area right now um, but yeah, I'm in, I'm in France. Uh, it, you know, the latency is one thing. I also probably have a little bit of brain latency because it's two 30 in the morning for me right now. Oh, actually, um, sorry. I've been up since like six. I'm, I'm getting yelled right. at. I'm getting yelled at Luke. One second. Okay. We do want to know what's going on. Uh, but Nick is asking me to point out that the color block hoodie, which has, was delayed for over a year is finally on lttstore.com. Finally, color block hoodies in short circuit colorway, tech linked colorway, tech quickie colorway, and LTT colorway. Finally there. The delay here was mostly down to making sure that the dark colors wouldn't bleed into the light colors in the wash and that the drawstrings wouldn't bleed onto the, um, the, the color under them. And it was a real, a real wow. hassle getting that right on the Tech Quickie one, for example. Uh, actually, it was a real hassle getting that right on all of them. But these things are flipping sick. They're $49.99. They're super comfy zip-up hoodies. They are definitely uh, an out loud kind of style. Um, I personally absolutely love the look. I fell in love with it when Lloyd first pitched me this. Man, it must have been, might have been almost two years ago. Um, what's a colorway? Oh. That's a, that's a good question. A colorway, think of it like a palette swap, but in real life. Okay, so a palette swap is a sprite that's the same, but just different colors. And a colorway is a product that's the same, but just in different colors. Yeah, it's, it's like a legendary palette swap skin in a game. It costs about the same amount, but you get a physical thing instead of the, the digital one. It's great. Uh, we have another announcement. You can now get our old school 20 packs of cable ties in black and white as a free item in checkout. So I believe our items are shoelaces, uh, sticker packs, and cable ties. Um, also, wow. we've got, oh, this is, this is interesting. We have, are looking for some feedback from our audience regarding style and fit for women's clothing. I want to make this very clear before I post the link. Only answer if you are comfortable doing so. We're, we are not going to be uh, doing anything with this data other than using it to help inform what types of fits and styles we should develop for women's clothing. Because something that... Well, you know, Bridget, ha Hannah, Alamade, okay, the Creator Warehouse team knew, but I did not fully understand before getting into this, is that women's clothing is a lot more difficult than men's clothing. Like, there is just so much diversity in body shape that I just, I, I mean, I, I'm not, like, I'm not checking out every woman I see. Like, I don't... I'm not, I ain't looking that close, you know? And so the second we started hiring models to come in and, and help with, with fit or, you know, having people internally try things and like Yvonne's putting things on for me at home and asking me what I think, I realized that, wow, compared to men's garments, which basically just comes down to, do you need a paunch pocket or do you not? You know, in terms of like making it more flattering, um, women's garments are a whole, just whole different can of worms. So yeah, we're going to go ahead and we're going to post this link. I want to make it very clear that this is intended for people who would like to be able to shop at the store, but find that we are not doing a good job of accommodating your body type, um, just to, to help, to help inform us, um, and help us understand, like, are you are you guys after you know this type of fit or that type of fit? Well, what do you want to see? 
What do you want to see? So there it is. I have spammed it into all the different chats. Go ahead and check that out. And now, Luke, what are you doing in En France? Yeah, so um, Shadow brought me out here. Mm. If you guys don't know what Shadow is, there's been a few videos uh, of them on the LTT channel before. Uh, but they're like, you you install this application on your computer, you run it, and then you can access a high-performance computer in the cloud, whatever. Cool, sounds good. Uh, they're rolling out something. I think they actually rolled it out last week called a power upgrade, which is basically they have this one server and they divide it into eighths. So you get one eighth of an epic CPU. You get w exactly one... Talking to the engineer about this was really interesting. This didn't really end up in the video too much other than just referencing it vaguely, but you get exactly one DIM of RAM and they actually make sure that your VM specifically only calls to that DIM. Oh, that's super cool. So you get yeah. a single channel, single channel bandwidth, but you will never be colliding with anyone else's requests essentially a little bit faster because it doesn't have to scan across multiple dims it is only ever addressing that one Got um, it. and then you get one full gpu um and the reason why i'm just saying gpu is because that part is going to be a little bit more variable right um they're planning on working with radeon in the future i saw them working with um uh crap what was it quadro 4500s i believe Anyways, yeah, you, 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 so you can get like a sick computer, basically. Their thing is they, they can run 1080p 240 or 4K 60, mm -hmm. and it's all through VM. So they, they got it. one interesting one. Oh, no, I can't say that. <laughs> oh. Yeah, don't get us in oh. trouble. Talking about this at 240 in the morning is scary. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it was sweet. So we, we went to, uh, OVH clouds, like R and D and manufacturing facility. Um, and we were able to see where they designed their own water blocks and they designed their own, uh, full copper water cooling runs. Okay. And that's cool. cool. That's really sweet. Uh, because every single server at OVH, every single one, no matter the spec is water cooled. Um, so they have like this really crazy infrastructure for all that. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so yeah, but we get to see their R&D facility for all this stuff. A lot of that I wasn't able to show on camera, but it's sick. Um, a bunch of the companies in the area around that facility are like there because of them. So there's like sheet metal manufacturing and they will make the custom rack mounts and chassis for OVH, which are like stamped by OVH and everything. There's PCB manufacturers that are making these dual PCI Express riser cards because they take these graphics cards that they get in, they completely pull all of the stock, um, like cooling hardware off of it, fans, radiators, they scrape off all the thermal taste, everything, pull it down to the absolute bare minimum, put on some, their own custom designed uh, uh, like uh, heat sinks uh, or water blocks, sorry, I'm tired. Um, and, and then they sandwich them together they make it so that two of these, like, these were Quadro 4500s. Two of them is literally that thick. Wow. So, like, do they, they have to kind of, load. do they have to kind of 69 them in order to make that work or, with the I.O. or what? No, they were the same way because they're, they're not running I.O., right? Oh, right. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, so it doesn't matter. Um, but, yeah, so they, they, they put four of these sandwiches of two into one server. Uh, and then they showed, like... They, they load Linux onto it over the network, and then they, they have this macro pad where they put inputs into Linux that just type out these long commands, and they benchmark it on the spot. They can turn uh, the, the like water cooling on and off, so they test to make sure the water cooling is working. They put it under load. They test that, blah, 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 blah. They build it all together. Super sick. And then from there, we went to... Um, there's a really cool way, if you can speak French properly, I call it grave lines. I think they call it like Graveline or something. I'm going to, that pronunciation is horrible. I'm sorry. But we went to the actual massive data center. And man, the stuff I couldn't show on camera was so cool. But the oh. stuff that I could show on camera was also really cool. So it's okay. It's still going to be really interesting to okay. watch. But they have like, again, the entire place is water cooled, right? Right. So like the pumps, 
and the reservoirs that they have are just crazy. Like I walked on top of one of their backup reservoirs, one of their many backup reservoirs. Their reservoirs outside are so gargantuan that I wasn't even able to show them on camera. They didn't want to show how they did it. Wow. Um, they have heat exchangers that are external to the building. So they, they pump all the hot water out, heat exchange it outside, and then pump the cold water back in. And there's like a 15 to 20 degree difference in the pipes. You can touch one pipe that's coming into the building and it's like nice and cold, it feels chilly. And then you move your hand, touch the other one, it's like slightly above room temperature. Wow. Just wild. And the whole thing is the whole thing is crazy. They're they're um they're coming for me. They're uh yeah. they're <laughs> they're backup reservoirs. We were able to look into one of them, and they have it looks like a like a super advanced like borderline space age pool skimmer. Yeah, but they have, uh. they have like these pool skimmers going around. They have these constant pH checks because again they're water cooling this entire building. So if it gunks, like that's horrifying. Right. right? Um, they have power wow. lines coming into the building that look like you're receiving power lines into a city. They have 220,000 volt, like industrial way above the ground power lines that are coming in on towers into the building. If those fail, they have a bunch of underground 20,000 volt power lines. If all of that, which is like basically never going to happen, but if all of that goes down, they have a series of these massive generators that they can run for 14 hours straight and each one of the generators they have a bunch of them each one of them produces one megawatt of power what what do they run yeah, on nuclear like, power huge. and they, wow. don't, they don't even really use them because they have both of the the standard setups for power right right so the, the the whole thing was just it was uh it was really it was very cool Man, I wish I'd gone. I mean, I was yeah. seeing some reasonably cool stuff too, but not 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 quite like that. Uh, now seems yeah, like cold room water cooling on steroids. I forgot to talk about the pumps. I thought this was actually pretty cool. They had massive pumps, like kind of all around the building, right? Yeah. You'd see them in a, in a bunch of different locations, but they're always in pairs. And pretty early on, the the guy that was giving me the main tour. Um, mentioned that they only run one of the two at a time but they swap every day the oh. whole data center will will swap to the other pump every day during the work week and then on weekends they don't but they do that to keep the same amount of worked hours on each one and because if they're swapping that constantly they're going to know if it's working or not so they they reduce failures that way interesting there's a lot of cool little insights like that but yeah it's gonna be sweet check out the video when it comes out but yeah shadow shadow brought us out there to show um what stuff they've been doing recently and how they're doing their power upgrade and all that all that jazz which is which is really awesome they worked with this part didn't actually make it into the video at all so this is purely additional information uh, but they worked with bandai namco for elden ring so when um, they gave reviewers review copies instead of giving them review copies they gave them shadow cloud PCs with oh. Elden Ring installed. So that way they and don't actually they have to distribute to... the software. Yeah, so they didn't have to send them the software. So they didn't have to worry about it being copied. They put watermarks on all the screens that you couldn't do anything about. So the That's higher pretty smart. security there. And then Bandai Namco was able to watch all of the reviewers playing their games on like big TV screens back at their office. Oh, um, that's pretty sick. Totally makes sense. That's what yeah. that, I guarantee you. That's where the entire game review industry is going to go for pre-release stuff. Yeah, like, hey, we noticed that Very you couldn't smart. get over that thing. Uh, this is how to do it. Uh, we're, we've discussed it with the team, and we're going to add this indicator to. You know, man, yeah, ha, oh, that's genius. Yeah, that's genius. Uh, people are asking on Floatplane Chat, is the streaming that good quality? I've tried out Shadow before. It was surprisingly usable. Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. Um, I saw, I saw a, a su uh, not, I was about to call it a super chat. I saw a merch message come up and, uh, someone asked, they said that their couch ripper pillow has absolutely been stolen by their cat who sleeps on it all the time and asked if we have considered pursuing pet beds. The answer is yes. 
Uh, this is the first mock-up for two different pet beds. Uh, one of them is like a classic tower-inspired pet bed. Lloyd really wants to do these accompanying hardware-themed pillows. I don't want to. I think that just the bed is fine. And then uh, also a monitor one that has kind of like a cool pixel pixel art thing inside. So there'll be kind of like fuzzy, uh, pillowy beds that'll either be like a, a case with the side panel popped open or a CRT monitor that your pet can go inside and sleep. So I just wanted to, to get that out there. Pretty cool, in my opinion. Um, yeah, people are pretty people are pretty stoked. Yes, uh, if we can figure it out, we will be we will be super super in. Um, we'll be super excited. Uh, we also need to talk about RDNA three. I mean, I guess there's not really there's not really that much to say that we didn't say in the video yesterday. Uh, it's a return to competition. I never thought I'd be so excited to see a thousand dollar and a nine hundred dollar GPU, and yet. Here I am, not that because I'm excited about a $900 GPU, but because I'm yeah. excited about what it indicates about the pricing of the rest of the stack, that we we might be going back to, you know, real world land instead of the fantasy land that Nvidia CEO lives in, where people like real people can spend $1,600 on a GPU. It's just ridiculous. Um, for those of you who missed our video yesterday, AMD was very vague about the performance of the upcoming 7900 XTX, that's the $1,000 variant, but they did give us relative performance compared to the 6950 XT at 4K. We were able to get some information about the test benches that they were running and extrapolate performance based on uh, drag racing a 6950 XT and an RTX 4090 and then applying AMD's cited performance uplift to the 6950 XT to give some idea of what a 4090 versus 7900 XTX shootout is going to look like. As anticipated, if you kind of have been paying attention to the industry for a while, NVIDIA uh, pushed the 4090 just hard enough to maintain the performance crown and no harder than that. Um, they're, they're Wadded their their thermal and their power consumption targets were clearly designed to make sure that they maintained the upper hand so that they could maintain their price premium, um, but didn't go any any harder at out of fear maybe of um, harming the reliability of the product. It's too early to say how accurate our estimates are, given the up to one point seven times faster. Um, might be when you're directly looking at a wall. Yeah, that actually means. Yeah, or into the skybox or yeah. whatever, right? Um, it's also possible that AMD futs to the numbers, but if they didn't, it looks like one heck of a fast GPU. And it looks like the RTX 4080 16 gig, based on NVIDIA's published numbers, might get absolutely destroyed by the 7900 XTX while costing $200 more. It's pretty dumb what has become a selling point for a GPU, under $1,000, supports the latest version of DisplayPort, doesn't risk burning your house down, <laughs> won't require a power supply upgrade, and should physically fit in your computer case. Like, really? That's the bar AMD had to meet in order to impress me. They met it, though. Maybe. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, Anthony, it's exciting though. I, I'm I'm happy about this. I I agree with you. I am more happy about this for not this card, but the other cards in the stack. Yeah. Um. I still think in in current years, spending a thousand dollars on a GPU is like crazy. Um. But yeah, it hopefully it means very good things for the cheaper cards in the stack. Uh, our discussion question here is, do you think this will even pressure NVIDIA or are they so entrenched in normie gamers' minds that this won't even be a problem for them? I think that's a very real possibility. I think that NVIDIA will just keep competing with themselves. NVIDIA only races against one company, NVIDIA. Uh, that's why, I mean, we saw this messaging change, man, ages ago. I think it was back when maybe... Uh, 960 or 1060 launched where they stopped comparing in their reviewers' guides to to 
other companies' cards and just started comparing to their own card from three years ago, showing what an upgrade this is for GeForce gamers. I was like, okay. Mm <laughs> but it's working for them. I mean, that's absolutely what Apple does for the most part. Actually, they, they provided a little more comparative performance data in the last couple of years. I think that's as fudged as it might have been. Um, I guess that's an improvement. Uh, now's probably as good a time as any for us to do some uh, merch messages. Do we have anything else? Oh, there's an update. Oh, goodness. There's an update on the 12 volt high power uh, connector. Uh, buh. Oh, boy. Um, John Jero has a good write up on it. Maybe I'll just show this to you guys. Okay, so it's from his blog, and you guys can go check it out. But basically, it's a little more complicated. Um, and this is an opinion piece, he says. So it's not meant to be the be all and end all, and it's a living document, but it may be a little more complicated than just bad, cheap adapters. So really good write up. You guys are going to want to check it out. Uh, let me just see if the summary here is pretty good. Latest casualty. Ah, uh, yeah, it looks like even some native cables are melting, not just adapters. <sighs> That's pretty rough. Um, the cables are based on the that same specifications rough. as the adapters. So this power supply uses 18 to 24 gauge wire for the 12 plus four pin connector. For those unaware, 24 gauge wire is rather thin. Uh, one major point that John says is to note that there are four layers of two ounce copper on the PSU power, uh, PCB, which is regular, but now they're moving to twice as much power in the same space as a single eight pin connector. So this won't cut it anymore. And also apparently the spec is supposed to be 16 gauge for the wires. And that's what the connectors have room for. So the discussion question is how much of this is user error, you know, like cranking on connectors and how much of this is the fault of either Nvidia or the power supply manufacturers or both. I'd say it's probably a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B, but if you have a connector that's intended for end user use, like you have to make sure it's idiot proof. It has flexible cables. We have been trained with good reason to believe that you can kind of crank power supply cables quite a bit with no issue for an extremely long period of time. I don't really see this being user error unless, unless these things came out of the box with absolutely extreme warnings, which as far as my understanding goes, they came with none. And also uh, like there was a note uh, previously saying that the MSI MEG AI 1300P power supplies cable was not bent very much and the connection was tight. People are still having these meltdowns when they use those brackets that bring the cable straight out for a little while and everything. Like it's, it's not enough. I, I don't, I don't consider this being under user error. All right, let's do some merch messages. Uh, let's make, let's make five minutes from now the cutoff. If you guys want to pick up a color block hoodie or order something else, get some cable ties, send in a merch message. Uh, Bell's going to be curating them and he's going to start hitting us with some of these merch messages. Hello. We got a lot of uh, potential ones if you want to take a look as well, Linus. Yeah, but I can first do that. question for you. Uh, for Luke, have you ever thought about open sourcing parts or all of Floatplane? Uh, we've, we've contributed to open source projects, and that is probably what we will continue to do. Um, I don't I don't think uh, just doing that makes a ton of sense. Uh, it's something that we have considered in the past. We decided it probably wouldn't be good for us at that time. I don't necessarily see that changing. I think the main thing that we plan on doing moving forward is just to continue to contribute as much as we can to the open source projects that we do use. Um, and that's that's probably about it. Next question here is from DigiDude. Linus, are there any videos that you may regret making maybe because you didn't have enough knowledge on the subject? Oh, I mean, every video. I mean, there's there's no video from 10 years ago that I don't know more about now and wish I hadn't done, wish I'd, and that I don't wish I had done a better job of. Uh, I'm always learning, um, you know, sometimes from the new team members, uh, sometimes from industry contact, sometimes from you guys. You know, sometimes you'll you'll see something in a video like I've got a I've got a knife I've got a knife in my lap and I'm like ah like cutting or whatever and you guys get real real upset about that. Uh, in that case, I would like to point out that, guys, I was not in any real danger. Uh, you can't tell because it's a two-dimensional image, but 
what was actually going on was it was it was like a solid 12 inches in front of my leg and I was cutting in an arc motion. So I was applying pressure away from my leg. There was actually no chance whatsoever of me cutting myself, but I recognized that I was not demonstrating good knife safety. And so for that reason, I, I, I think I pinned a comment that was critical of it or something like that. But don't worry, I was not gonna like cut open a major artery in my leg or anything like that. I, I got you guys, I'm gonna be around for a lot longer. Uh, the chats want you to know that your fly is open. <laughs> Thank you. I think that is what they wanted. <laughs> Next question here from Angus. Uh, what EV or hybrid hybrid would you buy if you had a budget of around $100,000 Canadian? Okay, to be clear, that was not nearly as bad as Ludwig, okay? <laughs> Sorry, what was the church message? <laughs> uh, if you had $100,000 Canadian, what EV or hybrid would you buy? Uh, ooh, that's a good question. Um, 100000 it's kind of like an awkward price point because it's like way more than a lot of the kind of sensible EVs. You know, like a, like a Mach-E seems pretty sensible. You know, Model 3, Model Y are kind of like sensible um, but it's a lot less than like the really cool EVs, like, you know, the Porsche Taycan or anything like that. Yeah, Luke, uh, why don't, why don't you do this one? I have no idea. I haven't been shopping for cars. Thanks. Um, Super useful. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Man. I don't know. Uh, Hyundai I has some really to, cool stuff. Yeah. I tried to recommend a vehicle to someone fairly recently i think i even told minus about this um and when they went to go try to buy it the dealer wanted two times the sticker price oh yeah that so was like the uh, f-150 lightning right yeah it, it's hard to recommend anything to anybody right now because like I, I, I can't like research something online and then know how much it's going to cost them in a price performance sense because dealers are just raking everybody um so yeah. i don't know um yeah, I don't know I don't that know. Uh, that BMW SUV looks pretty cool. Other than that, it doesn't have a round steering wheel. Thank you very much, Elon, for nothing. The whole not round steering wheel trend needs to die so fast. Um, yeah, Hyundai Kona Electric is pretty cool. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what to tell you guys. People are talking about like Polestar Two. <sighs> I've heard the software is kind of buggy. No, it's super nice. I test drove one uh, a week or so ago, and it's so nice. Okay. I don't know. Maybe this is one of those things where just like the 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 loudest users are like the the unhappiest users are the loudest ones or something like that. My best suggestion is to watch Short Circuit. Uh, we do EVs all the time, like the Bolt EUV. Another good car. All right, that's fair enough. <laughs> This, this guy promoting other channels. Okay, this is a totally competing, you know, tech channel here, Bell. Classic. Yeah. Uh, next question here AJ, from... See, AJ's suggesting a Fisker Ocean. Like, I just looked up on their website, and that's a $70,000 car. Okay. So if the... Oh, no. Fisker Ocean Ultra... Oh, no. Can There's you even buy this thing, though? Okay. How do you buy it? I have no idea. That's Reserve. the problem right now. Yeah. You can't buy like anything. It's like, yeah, you, you could buy a Rivian. If you can't can buy it's you? twice the price. So like, it's so, I don't know. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> Chat's like Omega lol Fisker. <laughs> don't buy this. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it'll be really good. Maybe it won't. If, if things don't exist, they're, they're vaporware, right? The only, the only time I've ever even heard of Fisker is in a, Donald Glover song, and he says "room room," and then says, "Wait, Fiskers don't make noise when they start up or something." Okay, like, okay. I don't know what any the ID Buzz looks pretty sick, though. Where's that? What is that? Volkswagen. It's the Volkswagen van, but electric and like kind of sick. That seems very smart. 
of them. Yep. It actually looks pretty cool. Uh, not coming until 2024, though. So again, that doesn't answer your question. You get it. Yeah. Uh, you know what? And once it comes out, there's not going to be enough availability. This is what you should do. You got a hundred grand today. Put down deposits on every electric car, and then as they arrive, complete your transaction and scalp them. Because as far as I can tell, yeah. that's what everyone's doing. There. Yeah. That's 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 my whole advice for the day. Oh, why is there an NFT collection of the Volkswagen van? <laughs> because you touch yourself <laughs> at night. <laughs> All right, what else you got? Next question here is from Digital Logic TV. Question about your PG42UQ. When you turn it on, do you get a burn-in looking line down the center for about 10 minutes that eventually fades away? Curious if it's just my panel and I should be looking for a replacement. Uh, that's pretty normal on OLED displays. At least it's not burn in, burn in. It's more of image retention than burn in, so it's not a huge problem. Uh, next question here from Scott. Oh, wait, hold on. I should clarify. Uh, that's only normal, though, if you often use it with like window snapping and there's a line there. If it's just happening and you didn't have anything with a line ever, then no, it's not normal and you should contact ASUS. Uh, as Scott was hoping to say, you've spoken in the past about the Vancouver housing market and how it's an added challenge in finding talent. But could you share any advantages the Vancouver area has that has helped make LMG great? Yeah, living here rocks. There's a reason everybody wants to be in Vancouver. That's it. Other than that, the Canadian dollar sucks. Housing market sucks. Commodity prices Microsoft suck. Microsoft and Amazon both have workplaces in downtown Vancouver that their only reason for existing is to as fast as possible rapidly funnel development talent away from Canada into Seattle um, so that that's pretty cool if you're trying to hire Canadian developers that's that's pretty sweet pretty helpful yeah, thanks sweet. Amazon no problems with that at all thanks Microsoft love that brain yeah. drain Next question here is from Adam. Uh, hi, Linus. My wife and I game in a small room that gets hot quick. Would you suggest we do water cooling with insulated pecs to a radiator in the basement or put computers in the basement and do fiber, HDMI, or in, uh, and USB? Both are valid solutions. I would say the one that is the lesser amount of maintenance in the long term and the one that I've settled on is moving the computer away and then running long cables, running an umbilical cord to the PC. I actually pitched this to the Creator Warehouse team earlier this week, but I think that it would be super cool once we're doing our own cables to do bundles, like umbilical cord bundles of not super expensive like fiber optic cables, but just long validated copper cables at various lengths, like a 10 foot umbilical cord for running you know, to the next room over, like a 15 footer for going down one floor and just having that as like a one piece thing that people can buy um, to move their computer into another room. Because honestly, it's, it's like a significant quality of life improvement to have the noise and the heat away from you somewhere else in the house. Another question here from Derek. Would you let your kids work at LTT if they asked at 15, 18, or 20? And if so, would you start them at the bottom or something more prestigious? What do you think I should do? They've never asked. There's a good question. Um, I think starting them in a prestigious position would be super douchey. Oh, well, that's um, not happening. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, yeah. I meant like, do I even want my kids to be like influencers? Like, I, I don't know. Like, I, I think work. There's work at the various companies that's not being an influencer. No, I mean that's true. But like, okay, so here, here's a, here's a question, right? Like, what would they do? Like, I, I wouldn't. They wouldn't have any experience. We don't hire interns. Like, we don't, we don't do any of that stuff. So that's the biggest problem. Don't really have a ton of junior positions. Yeah, we, we generally um, like to have people who are like really good here. Hit the ground running, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
like something I could see is if they wanted to try their hand at, you know, starting a channel or something, you could kind of shovel them off into a corner somewhere and say, okay, good luck. Um, you know, I'll talk about it a couple of times, but other than that, don't expect daddy to just like make your career for you. Um, cause like realistically, none of my kids are particularly into tech anyway. So it's not like they would be at home just in tech. I, I mean, something like channel super fun, they're already having a blast with, and they are pretty funny in, but like. Little they, man seems to definitely know his way around things. Oh, but, he's uh, kid's a troll. I don't know where he gets it from. No, but there was stuff like, like remember when he was setting up that Minecraft thing? Oh, that's true. Like he he knows what he's doing. He's very familiar with stuff, but but I don't think he it's it's. I think it's more of a means to an end type of situation. Yes, I don't think he's passionate about technology. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, we should we should uh, cut them here, like for incoming ones. But yeah, we should do some more. Next question here from Anon: With the M1 and M2 Mac showing the benefits of ARM on a laptop, do you think it's time for Intel or AMD to begin investing in either ARM or RISC Five? Is I mean, it state? Yeah, AMD has already started on their server chips. Um, you can, I, you, can, I promise you. Both of them are looking at both of those technologies very, very intently. Next question here is from Tyler. Video games are the best, but board <laughs> games are awesome. Close second. Do you and the family have any board game nights? And if so, what kind of games? Uh, yeah, we do. Um, my kids like the Quacks of Quedlinburg. Um, everyone in the family likes Catan. That's a little old for me at this point, but the, the kids really like it. Um, my son's pretty into any kind of like strategy game. Uh, there's this one that he and my wife play with a bunch of black and white uh, like stones. They're not checkers. They're like stones and you can like jump as many of them as you want in a row or something like that. I forget what it's called, but they like it. Um, Blockus is another really good one. Really good game. I used to play Azul with... Uh... Oh, Azul is great. With the late and great Tyler. Um, and I picked that up recently so I can play it again in the future. Next question here from Anon. Any more home lab content coming? Would love to see more. I don't know if it's specifically home lab content, but Anthony has a video upcoming on PyKVM, which is super cool and an essential piece of any home lab that you wanna be able to work on from far away. If you have a mixture of like proper enterprise hardware that has built in uh, like IKVM and you know, like random consumer grade stuff that's kind of mixed in with it. Pi KVM is super cool. Uh, oh, I should explain what it is. It basically uses a Raspi to allow remote access to anything like full keyboard mouse as if you were sitting in front of it control, you know, update BIOSes and uh, install operating systems and all that kind of stuff without it as a, as a, a built-in feature. So it's going to be a video that's worth checking out. Next question here is from Bien. How was quality, uh, how was video quality control back when you first started and how did you decide when a video was good enough? At what point or milestone did you decide it was time to up the production value? Uh -huh. quality control, you say? I don't think we had any QC until years after we moved into this office. They, they just went up. And then the number of times that we would have problems with videos that were catastrophic. Um, oh, I lost so much sleep. Um, how do we decide that a video is good enough? It's, I mean, it's good enough when you do your best and the best that you can do for today's video and then you move on and you try and do better tomorrow. I mean... That's always been kind of the philosophy. Shipped is better than perfect. And, and you know, obviously we don't want to get things wrong, but you're talking about production values here, I think. And so from my point of view, uh, camp is fine. As long as it doesn't seem like you tried to make the slickest possible production, there's nothing wrong with just having some fun with it and uploading something that's kind of you know, obviously bad. There are situations where it's bit us in the butt. For example, the iMac, uh, the broken iMac debacle. We were accused of faking 
Anthony shorting out the board in it when our intention was that it was supposed to be campy, obviously fake, but some people thought it was like good. Like we got too good for our own good. Some people believed that it was real or that we thought people would believe it was real, but we were actually just campily reenacting it. So uh, there's a there's a balancing act, I think, between um, spending time on on upping production values and just focusing on getting the message across. Um, I'm more of a message across guy, but a lot of the production folks, you know, really want to polish up the videos more. So there's always that push and pull. I'll also say there was a second part of that question I was asking about, like, how do you decide to start doing improvements? Improvements have absolutely been constant the whole way through. So and I've been dragged kicking and screaming always. pretty much every step of the way when it comes to production value improvements. <laughs> Sometimes you don't quick and, uh, kick and scream quite so hard, though. Yeah, these days I'm pretty chill about it. But back when we didn't have any money and people would tell me, oh, we need to spend $1,000 on a microphone. It's like, you f***ing kidding me? $1,000 on a microphone? <laughs> What does it come with a car? You know. <laughs> Question here from Brendan. Do you think AMD's driver issues are over? I suspect with the new chiplet design, it might be a challenge since it's new and maybe that's why they didn't show as many benchmarks. Over is a big word. I mean, I don't think anybody on Earth's driver issues are over, but user feedback that I've seen has been that it's much improved. And so I hope that we will see that continue with the 7000 series, but maybe that'll be a perfect time for Luke and I to do an AMD challenge and see how we feel about that in the real world. Yeah. Question here from Grant. My father has his own podcast that I've never listened to, despite all my family does and insists I do. Does your family watch your podcasts and videos? Nope, my family has no idea what I do other than my mother-in-law. She like actually follows and pays attention and will ask me about stuff I talked about on WAN show and stuff, which I think is hilarious. Uh, my, oh, I should say, not the content, but my aunt and uncle also follow very closely on the business side. My uncle was an entrepreneur and he was one of, I think, probably the only influence in my life before I started working at NCIX who pushed me to get into business and and uh, entrepreneurial pursuits. Everyone else was basically like, stay in school, get a government job, get a pension, you know, uh, keep your keep your head down, don't you know, don't rock the boat, just, just take the safe, steady path. Um, this has definitely been higher risk, but it's also, you know, gone pretty well so far. So I I I'm very grateful to him for bringing that up to me because it wasn't something that was really talked about in school all school talks about is more school and that's not necessarily the right answer every time yeah, yeah my my mom and dad watched um and my girlfriend watches when she shows when show to my birds because my birds won't stop screaming because i'm not there <laughs> oh yvonne watches lmg clips i think that's the main channel she watches Oh, okay. Like, mostly yeah. to see if I like mention her, I think. <laughs> Shout out LMG Clips. Uh, go subscribe. Uh, uh, question here. From... <laughs> yeah, the other channel that Bell manages. You stop, you stop pimping your channels here. Hey, we got great channels. You should go subscribe to all of them, starting with Short Circuit and LMG Clips. <laughs> okay. <laughs> question here from uh, Kashagra. Thoughts on sticking to a $500 and below Roku TV of the sort or going big on a $2,000 plus TV in hopes for at least some of the F word future proofing? The changes in TV seem quite overwhelming. There's been a period of extremely uh, strong innovation in TVs. So I think that we're going to see a bit of a slowdown period. I think we're going to have a bit of a hangover from, from what we've seen in the last five years. However, one of the things that's happening right now as a result of that surge of innovation and competition is prices are getting so aggressive. Some of the LG OLED deals that we've seen in the lead up to Black Friday have been wild. 
So while I would love to say that now is the time to buy a top tier TV and just be happy with it for the next five to 10 years, and you could, I think you could do that today. Uh, if I picked up like a Quantum Dot OLED or one of LG's current gen OLEDs and treated it well, right? So you got to be cognizant of burn-in, particularly on the LG models. Um, we Well, I should say we might. And it's theoretically, the QD OLED ones are not as susceptible, but anything's an unknown quantity until it's actually been out in the real world for an extended period of time. I'd like to say that now's a great time to pull the trigger, but I don't know what's around the corner, right? Um, I don't think we're going to see another big paradigm shift in the next few years, though. It seems like we're going to see mostly generational improvements for a bit here. Like, I don't think micro LED is around the corner at all. Next question here from Brian. Any time frame for if or when there'll be a rain cover from the backpack? Got a flood warning yesterday where I live in the UK. And I'm thinking by the time a backpack arrives, we're going to have all the rain we're going to get for the winter. But that's wishful thinking. Um, we do have our first sample of it. The, there are some fit issues and some areas where we can improve the waterproofness of it. So, I mean, it's probably going to be anywhere from three to six weeks for another sample. Then we'll have to actually send the PO, then production, then shipping. I mean, I, I think we're going to miss this rain season. I'm sorry. But uh, next year? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, things take time. I wish it wasn't that way. I wish every sample could be perfect on the first try. Like color block hoodie, man. This took like over a year. Actually, this took way over a year. This is probably <laughs> almost a two year project. Ridiculous. Worth it though. Question here from Sam, please. Please tell us your thoughts on the Sim series. My girlfriend has wanted to know for many moons. Did you ever play Sims, Luke? I actually did. Um, my dad and I played, it must have been Sims 1 when I was like really little. And I, but I remember we like, there's no way we played it properly because all we cared about was like min maxing the the like career progression of our sim and just like hoarding money and then we bought the like really big mansion at the top and when we got it we were like well we beat the game right <laughs> i mean there's we no right or wrong win. way to play sims right so uh, luke try <laughs> hard sims we bought the big house. <laughs> okay Oh my goodness. <laughs> I heard there's a new one coming out though, and that's cool because the Sims community, like, I feel so bad for them. They they get games so infrequently. The content yeah. that they get is yeah. like all these expansions, they're like, oh, you get four shoes, a shirt, and a pair of pants, and it's gonna cost you thirty bucks. Yeah. Like it's they get screwed so much. It's so like the it, EA sports good. model, but even worse. Yeah, yeah. So I mean if they're getting something new. That's because Sims 4, I feel like it's been out for so long. Like, hopefully, they actually get something new. I don't know. That's all I'll say. But yeah. Next question here from Joshua. I work third shift and I'm usually asleep while you're streaming, so I'm happy to finally send a merch message. Am I able to use an Arc GPU for Plex hardware encoding? If so, which one should I buy? It would have to be explicitly supported by Plex. Uh, to my knowledge, Plex doesn't have support for AV1 yet, uh, but you guys will have to correct me if I'm wrong. So stay tuned. If you want to use an Arc GPU for AV1 encoding, though, it doesn't matter which one. So you could go with the A380, and it has, to my knowledge, the exact same encoding hardware that the A770 or the A750 do. We've had a lot of people ask uh, if you have any thoughts on the INEO 2 or the GPD Win 4. Have you had any experiences with them yet? Uh, I think I'm supposed to get hands on with an INEO 2 soon. Looks super exciting. I mean, we're talking Steam Deck like performance in what looks like a bit more of a digestible form factor. And I don't know what kind of display is coming on the INEO 2. I actually mm, haven't looked into it enough, but it's one of those things where I've kind of been lazy about it because I know they're going to send me one, so I'll get a chance to experience it for myself. 
uh, Hall Effect, oh yeah, the Hall Effect joysticks and triggers. That's super sick. Although it is something that you can upgrade your Steam Deck with, so it's not like it's a huge, ad like, unovercomable advantage over the Steam Deck. The pricing's more, but it's got a big, ooh, big fat battery. Ooh. 1200p display. Oh, INEO 2 is looking pretty sick. Is it OLED, though? I don't know. It doesn't say, which means probably not. I'll have to I'll have to check into it. My only real complaint about the INEO I have now, aside from that I'd love to have more performance, and this one will with RDNA 2 graphics, is that I wish that the brightness got lower. I wish their display controller could allow it to get dimmer when I'm playing at night. That's my that's my only real complaint about the INEO Next, which is the one that I'm daily driving right now. Next question here is from John. What are your thoughts on the direct storage API? With the massive increase in power of GPUs, do you think that it'll give a boost to the used GPU market? A boost to the used GPU market? I think you might be misunderstanding a little bit what direct storage is for. Uh, direct storage is for allowing your GPU access to your storage. Um, it's not like a it's not like a GPU accelerated RAID or anything like that. So I don't think it, people are going to be using more GPUs. They're just going to get more benefit from faster storage in their system, kind of like the Xbox Series is and the PlayStation Five. Question from Scott, but as well as a few different people, uh, can we get an update on the Black Shaft screwdriver? Uh, yes, uh, we're hoping to start shipping in the next week or two, but it's going to take some time because there is a backlog. Uh, we did say those were going to be delayed. So we did. Um, and they were. So it worked. Uh, next question from Gabriel is another screwdriver question. Are there any plans for a screwdriver case or one for additional bit packs that we may purchase? Uh, we'd love to, but in the meantime, I saw it on the subreddit a while back. Someone designed a 3D printable one. So you should you should do that. Another merch question here from Ben. Have the zipper pulls been decided on for the backpack? And if so, how do we go about getting those? Uh, no. I actually have three different pulls on my bag right now that I'm using as part of this process of making sure that we don't this up again. <laughs> yeah. From Charles, as somebody who's had to pay $70 for printer ink this week, has LTT ever considered covering printers? We want to, actually. I think our plan is to do like a hey, I have this much money to spend. Is there any printer that doesn't totally suck video? But nobody wants to do it. I think it's assigned to Tanner right now because he volunteered to do that awful dash cam video. To be clear, good video, awful experience evaluating horrible, bad, awful products. Um, so he's going to get to it when he gets to it, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, from Anon, Hi, Linus. What's the most expensive yet useless or preventable mistake you've made while building LTT? I don't know, Luke. Maybe this is a good one for you. You look totally zoned, though. <laughs> Sorry, man. It's 3.30 in the morning. Can you restate the question? <laughs> I would love to. Uh, Anon asked what the most expensive yet useless, maybe preventable mistake was when building LTT. Red cameras? Okay. Okay, counterpoint. Counterpoint. Was it a mistake with all the content we got out of them? And all the additional exposure we Ooh. got out of other creators talking about okay. it? Okay. So that's entirely what complicates every single potential answer to this. Because as a company, every potential waste of money is just a potential increase of money. Because <laughs> if we make some massive mistake, if the server room goes on fire, content. if we drop something really expensive, content. If, we do, if we do whatever, it's all content. Yeah, It's all content. The so reds, like it's, it's actually very hard to answer. The reds are particularly hard to evaluate. So obviously we didn't recoup our cost from just that one, you're so expensive video. Not even, not even close, but... That video 
And more. Corridor Digital's response to it was the reason we ever engaged with Corridor, whom we've collaborated with multiple times since then, which has been good for our cross-pollinating our audiences and exposure. Okay, We upgraded uh, our workstations and made videos about that in order to... Um, uh, in order to handle this 8K video, we upgraded our storage server and made videos about that in order to handle 8K video. We made a video about Red's accelerator card, which we wouldn't have been able to evaluate properly without all this library of 8K video. Um, we upgraded our other archival storage servers, which was also content in order to accommodate this growing library of 8K video. So it's like... Really, really hard yeah, to hard. evaluate. And there have been shoots that we've done where we would have wanted to rent, rent greater than prosumer grade cameras, like cameras at that tier. And we didn't have to pay rentals because we just owned them. So the fact that we daily drove them for so many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours. I mean, at this point, I consider them like paid off assets. We still have two of them. Uh, we still have our... our um, DSMC2, and we still have a, a Weapon 8K or something like that. And we're probably not going to get rid of them because uh, they're just, they, they, they are really useful. And like I said, I consider them a, a, a paid off, an accounted for asset from my point of view. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough because we're, we've, we've become very, very good at not necessarily even become. We have, pretty much always been very, very good at, at turning everything into content, right? I think we're worse at it now. One of the first hurdles that we had to jump, sorry? I think we're worse at it now. Like, really? we, we almost didn't make a video about that RF chamber fiasco, and that was one of the best performing ones we uploaded in the last month. And oh, yeah, it, no, you absolutely should have done yeah, that. Yeah, like, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't even know what was going on. That was, that was a video that was decided on on Thursday afternoon because we needed something to shoot that week. And I was like, what do you mean you don't think this is a video? We can talk about the principles of like RF chambers and testing. We can talk about what's coming down the pipe for the lab. We can talk about the whole fiasco with the billing us 45 grand and then completely ghosting us. We can go build a fort and sit in it. Like that is like, if anything, we have too much content. And so sometimes I think our mentality is a little bit wrong lately. Like if it's not like an in-depth review of a product or, um, you know, like a long detailed vlog about something, it's like not a video anymore. I'm like, no, people want to know what's going on over here. And there's so many learning outcomes from that one. Like that one was obvious to me, but I, sometimes I just don't even know what's going on anymore. And I think that's a big challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I don't know. Complicated question. It's hard to measure these things. A uh, question from Brendan, something else that's hard to measure. When it comes to Intel's E or P core design and AMD using normal cores for all cores, what would you recommend to someone who likes to watch YouTube and have other apps open while gaming, etc.? Both are good. Both. <laughs> Why not both? Why not both? Next question here is from Milosh. Linus, regarding the house build, I'm going through a build project at the moment in Australia, and I'm finding the professional standards of most trades is surprisingly low and incredibly overpriced. What has your experience been in organizing the trades for your house? Terrible. I actually um, definitely have some stuff to talk about at some point, but right Wait. now I need the project done. Is the pool done? No. Not even close. Oh. Not even close, dude. Not even close. Our backyard is a swamp right now. Like, it's disgusting. Yvonne has to literally go out every morning to tell the people on site what they're working on, assuming they're there. They don't tell us if they're coming or not coming. She has to tell them what they're working on because they don't get any communication from head office. I got some stories, but I'm not going to talk about it right now. Uh, that's it. That's it. Thank you so much, all of you, for tuning into the WAN show. We will see you again next week. Same bad time, same bad channel. Bye. Oh yeah, he's got this. He's he's fine. He's fine. Oh wait, I'm not supposed to roll the <laughs> intro. Bell, you 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 could... uh, my my WAN outro button is not doing anything. You good? 
Oh, oh, the WAN outro button's not doing anything. That's okay. We uh, we acknowledged Did all of. Uh, I think we acknowledged all of the merch messages already. Anyway, so I think we're good. So I'll just do it. Sorry, Luke. I know we're not supposed to do that. Look at the face he's making. So disappointed. Sorry, Luke. Did you start the server? I don't know. I'm gonna say yes so I don't get in trouble. Just kidding. I'm just here so I don't wow. get fined. Okay, how do I get the mouse over here? Oh, there it is. Hi, buddy. Oh, the show is brought to you today by Squarespace, Backblaze, and Extra.